in Wolverong country. Peter is in Boonwurrung land. And Alan, Chris, Rick, and myself are in Wurundjeri, Narap and Beek, Wurundjeri land and country. They've cared for these lands for many tens of thousands of years in a sustainable and responsible manner. And with much to learn from them in their methods and procedures. I offer my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and to elders from any other mobs who are with us tonight, and to any other people with us tonight, and a special welcome to you all. I'm Rob Gardner, and I help organise these meetings with Chris, Peter and Rick. Now tonight we are very honoured and very fortunate to have Alan talking to us. Alan originally was a scientist and became the CEO of a not-for-profit national climate change group. She's been very active in many climate change, uh, clean energy, social justice events for quite a few years. And she's now our member for Melbourne in the Victorian Parliament. So thank you for Ellen for being our second presenter in a renewed webinar. And hopefully we uh, don't have too many glitches. Um, and I think that's all from me and I'll pass you over to Ellen. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me and thank you also to everyone for everything you're doing out in the community to help us transition towards climate solutions. Uh, it feels kind of strangely intimate doing a webinar from your own home. I poured myself a glass of wine, so hopefully everyone else has got a cup of tea or something. Uh, and you can settle in for about an hour of talking about where we're up to in climate change uh, when it comes to Victoria specifically. And I am here in our own Wurundjeri country. I hope that you're all surviving at home, particularly those of you who've just finished the first school day. I've got a one-year-old and a three-year-old. So it's a crazy time for me, but I also feel very lucky that I haven't had to homeschool them while I've also had to do my job. So hats off to anyone who's done that today. Um, so tonight I'd like to talk to you about four main topics. So firstly, a brief overview about where Victoria is at and where we're tracking in terms of our emissions and climate impacts. Secondly, to give you a snapshot of the success that we've had in Victoria in taking action on climate change and some of our, particularly our achievements in the energy space. Thirdly, to talk about where there might be gaps or opportunities for Victoria to do more in the fight against climate change and where we might be headed over the next 10 years. And lastly, to have a bit of a discussion with you about how do we all think about climate change during a pandemic? Our world is so remarkably different from a month or two months ago when climate change was at the top of the agenda. Uh, we were all reeling from the summer's bushfires. How do we now think about climate change and how do we make sure that governments are still taking action on climate change during this really strange, strange time that we live in. So to start off with, I thought that most of you are probably energy nerds. I mean that in the kindest way, so am I. If you don't already spend your time poring over greenhouse gas inventories, I've dug up a special graph for you all showing the latest data we have on the Victorian emission reduction figures. Now, the first problem you might recognise from this graph is that it only goes up until 2017, and that is three years ago. Uh, I, that's no uh, mistake. Uh, the, the problem that we have is that we rely on the federal government for greenhouse gas data for every state. And there's a big time lag. So this report was actually released only six months ago, but it only has data up until 2017. So now you can see the graph. Um, so it is still a useful graph, even though it only goes up until 2017. It um, shows Victoria's greenhouse gas emissions between 1990 and 2017 from each different sector. So essentially what you're looking at here is a graph that shows that our emissions peaked in about 2011. It actually then reduced while we had a carbon price and then largely flatlined pretty much when the carbon price was taken away. Uh, the main point is that the, the orange bar is electricity generation. And you can see that that's by far and away the biggest source of Victoria's emissions is from electricity. And as you would know, that is brown coal in Victoria. 
However, there are some other interesting trends that aren't, it's a bit hard to see on a small graph, but for example, yellow is transport and transport emissions is one to watch, it is increasing. Um, there are two bits of data missing from this graph. One is the reduction emissions from closing the Hazelwood power plant in 2017, which aren't fully reflected on this graph because it only goes until 2017. So we'll have seen a bit of a drop in emissions from electricity due to Hazelwood closing. But not as much as you may have expected because we did then import more black coal from New South Wales. The other thing that's missing from this graph is the huge amount of carbon emissions from our most recent summer bushfires, which of course were devastating on so many different levels, the not least of which is their impact on the climate. So that you'll notice the dotted blue line is 2005 emissions. And this is the baseline that the Victorian government uses to set emission reduction targets into the future. So you'll see here that our current emissions are just a little bit below 2005 levels. But the reason that that's an interesting baseline for you to know about is because in order to meet our global commitments to the Paris Agreement, so this is the agreement that, that government signed up to to saying, yes, we want to keep global warming to less than 1.5 degrees, if Victoria was to do our part of that, we'd need to get about 90% below 2005 levels by 2030. So you can see where we're at at the moment, shows we're nowhere near 90% below 20, 2005 levels. And so we will need some huge changes in order to get us where we need to go. So the graph that we're looking at now is a graph that was produced by the Australian Energy Market Operator and it shows uh, the source of energy for Victoria. And brown, of course, is for brown coal. Yellow is for solar and photovoltaics. Green is for wind. Blue is hydro. And towards later years, 2033 onwards, you can see a bit more PV coming into the system, a bit more storage, a bit of peaking gas as well. But the main thing to note from this graph is that currently, we still get most of our energy from coal. And on current trends, it's still looking like we will get most of our energy from brown coal into the future, even out to 2040. Currently around 50% of our emissions come from burning coal. It is by far the biggest source of our emissions in Victoria. And coal still accounts, even after Hazelwood closed, still accounts for about 70% of our energy use in Victoria. And the unfortunate thing is that even though we might know this, most Victorians have no idea we burn so much coal in this state. We recently did some research, some focus groups that showed that people didn't really understand the connection between coal and emissions and between coal emissions and climate change. So we still burn about a million tonnes of coal a week in Victoria. Of course, it's the most, the least efficient coal, brown coal, and we still do have the dirtiest power station in the country, right here in Victoria, which is Yulon. So we still have these three brown coal stations operating, Yulon, owned by Energy Australia, Luoyang A, owned by AGL, and Luoyang B, owned by Alinta. Uh, and not, they're not only polluting, but they're old and also increasingly unreliable, and also a, a really nasty source of uh, other pollutants like mercury with health impacts. And in terms of its unreliability, your lawn broke down 33 times in the last 18 months, 33 times. So whereas once coal might have been seen as a reliable form of so-called baseload power, there's an increasing awareness in the government and the community now that that's no longer the case. Uh, it's not only dirty, but it's actually quite risky to rely on coal, especially as our summers get hotter when most of the breakdowns occur. So it's just important to keep those, those key facts um, in play as we talk about why we need to transition Victoria and how we might get there, it's good to know where we're starting from. But this webinar definitely isn't about doom and gloom. Uh, what I want to talk about is what we are doing in Victoria, how we are leading some of the good news and also some of the good news about where we might be able to, to do even more. So let's talk about some of the achievements that Victoria has been able to achieve over the last few years. We've taken some really important steps towards tackling climate change over the last five years in particular. Uh, three years ago, the Victorian Parliament introduced and passed the Climate Change Bill. So now we have a Climate Change Act. 
And what this does is that it requires the government to actually meet a target of net zero emissions by 2050, so in 30 years. But probably even more important than the long-term goal is that it requires the government to, whichever government's in power of the day, to set targets every five years. So the first two being 2025 and 2030, so in five years and in 10 years. And so it's important to set these long-term goals to know where we're go going, but actually the short-term goals are almost more important because they're the things that will reduce emissions now. And we know that reducing emissions earlier is much easier and more cost-effective than waiting to the last minute. It's very similar to a public health crisis, in fact. The earlier you can take action, the less painful it will be and the more chance you have of avoiding a disaster later down the road. And of course, all of you are so uh, knowledgeable about climate change already, you already know these principles. The issue is that the government was due to make their decision on the 2025 and 2030 targets in March this year, but due to the COVID pandemic, it has been put off into some time in the unknown future. We don't know when they will be setting those targets now, but we'll talk a little bit about that towards the, the end of the presentation. But not setting those targets hasn't let Victoria stagnate too much. We, we absolutely need those targets, but we have been getting on with building renewable energy in the meantime, which is excellent. Uh, so as well as having this Climate Change Act enshrined in legislation and emissions targets, which will be set, Victoria also legislated a Victorian renewable energy target. And at the moment, it's set at 50% by 2030. So you'll recall from earlier on, I was saying that we get about 70% of our energy currently from ground coal. We get about 20% from renewables. And so we're hoping to increase that to 50% by 2030. And actually we're already on track to meet that with the current policies the government has implemented, which is really good news. And the government's largely done that through a mechanism called reverse auctions, which many of you will be familiar with where the government essentially guarantees a price for energy for long-term renewable energy projects and, and companies bid as to who can build projects for the lowest price. And these policy tools are not only creating renewable energy, but they're actually very low cost for the government as well, um, because renewables are becoming cheaper and cheaper. In some cases, the reverse auctions have actually made the government money. So in the case of wind energy, for example, Victoria is now producing over 1,700 megawatts of wind power from 25 wind farms across the state, 25. And there's another 1,900 under construction. So we've built about 1,700 and there's another 1,900 in the works. So we're looking to double that over the next little while and get us from 20% to 50% in the next 10 years. And something that I'm particularly excited about is that Victoria could be the first state to progress an offshore wind farm, the Star of the South. Some of you might have read about this. And offshore wind really is quite a game changer because it brings a really large amount of new renewable energy capacity online, enough to replace an entire coal power station. So the Star of the South is a wind um, farm that's proposed off the coast of Gippsland. And if it's built as it's intended to be, it could produce 18% of Victoria's energy, nearly 20% of Victoria's energy from one wind farm. So great for employment. And um, we know that offshore wind has been a key element of what's seen a rapid transition to 100% renewables in some European countries, uh, like Scotland, for example. Uh, so that's the the larger scale renewable energy that Victoria has been quite successful at building to date and hopefully will continue along that path. Uh, the government's also been very focused on smaller scale renewable generation. Uh, you, I'm sure very familiar with the Solar Homes pro project, which is rebates for rooftop PV. Also, there are some rebates for batteries and hot water systems to a lesser extent. Um, and this was really the flagship policy the government put to the election in 2018. Uh, it gives around $2,000 in rebates to homeowners willing to put solar on their roof. So paying for about a half to a third of the total cost of that system. And it's, it's had such huge take up. It's been 
in fact, overwhelmed and redesigned a few times because of the large take-up. And look, it might not be the best bang for buck in terms of dollar per emission saved, but it has played an important role in, in popularising the government's renewable energy initiatives and in particular countering attacks from, uh, you know, the, the dark forces who might like to say that uh, renewable energy raises people's bills or costs money and is unaffordable, whereas I think the government was quite smart at having a policy which centred on households and households saving on their energy bills. Uh, to, to make sure that renewables was not used as a, a stick to, to hit them with at an election time. So I'd like to talk also briefly about uh, the grid. Uh, very, uh, not as probably as sexy as putting solar on roofs, but very, very important, as I'm sure a lot of you know. As you would know, I don't need to explain to you that the, the Australian East Coast Energy Network was built for a very, very different age. One in which our power came from a small number of very large generators, coal stations, and is simply just not fit for the future that we need, not fit for a future that needs generation and storage, and where our generation is a lot more dispersed geographically. So the inadequacy of our grid has been compounded by privatisation as well in Victoria. Private companies have been able to make big profits off the network, but the upgrades that have been needed in certain areas haven't happened. Whereas in other places like New South Wales, we've seen this huge gold plating of the energy grid, uh, wasting a lot of money and putting investment into areas that were also not needed. So as a result, here in Victoria, we actually have a large number of renewable energy projects that are being constrained by the limitations of the grid. So in North and West Victoria alone, there's 2,300 megawatts of wind and solar projects waiting to happen that can't go ahead because the grid can't handle it. So to give you an idea of how much energy that is, Hazelwood was 1,600 megawatts of capacity, and this is 2,300 megawatts that's being held back. So more, much more than a Hazelwood power station. Uh, the good news is that earlier this year, the Victorian government did give up on waiting for the federal energy regulator to pass new laws and enable us uh, to make, sorry, they, they gave up on waiting for the federal ed regulator to do anything. And we actually passed new laws in parliament to enable the Victorian minister uh, to make upgrades to our own grid here in Victoria. So ideally this kind of thing should be happening at a national level and in a coordinated way across each state. But in, in the current system that we have where that's not happening, the, the go it alone approach of states is sadly becoming necessary. And South Australia has actually already done this to enable the, their Tesla battery, which is now making money. And we know that New South Wales is considering doing this as well. Now we don't know exactly what the Victorian government is planning to do with the new powers that they've given themselves to upgrade the grid. And I think the success of this policy will be whether they actually use them, whether they use these powers to force an upgrade of the grid, say in North and West Victoria. Um, so th this will be a very important space to watch because as much as we'd love to put, just pump more renewables into the grid, if the grid can't handle it, then we have a problem. So I've been talking a lot about coal uh, necessarily, but it's important to note that we we shouldn't let this ever become a debate about climate action versus people. Coal plants employ people, that's a fact. And our transition to renewable energy, while it's absolutely necessary, it will have an impact on some communities more than others. And in particular, it will have an impact on the communities in the Latrobe Valley, which are some of the most disadvantaged in our state. And the people in the valley, I've been down there, uh, you know, probably nearly 10 times since I've been elected to speak to people down there. And people are really proud of their history in providing energy to Victoria. And in many ways, it's because of these people that Victoria was able to become prosperous and to rely on cheap energy, for example, for our manufacturing sector. And this community was really devastated by energy privatisation in the 90s, uh, where corporate owners did make a lot of profit and really left the community behind with high unemployment and a lot of social issues. And so 
Unfortunately, that trend continued with the closing of Hazelwood in 2017. Although everyone knew that it was coming, that Hazelwood would close, the plans to help transition workers and support the community, they weren't put in place until after Hazelwood made that announcement. And so for any transition that we're all advocating to renewable energy, we can't let this happen again. Communities do deserve certainty. They deserve investment in new industries and jobs before the old ones close. And interestingly, we've seen recently Germany has, has shown us the way in how to do this in closing all their power plants without, without losing any jobs and with really supporting the community as we go. Um, a number of years ago, I was involved in putting a proposal to the government for a body called the Latrobe Valley Authority. And it was a body modelled on the Queensland Reconstruction Authority after the floods. And it was a way of bringing together key stakeholders like business, industry, state government, council, to coordinate a transition plan for the area. And it's done some really good things, some great investment in healthcare, in tourism, in energy infrastructure, in batteries in the valley. But the funding does run out this year. So it'd be worth um, just keeping an eye on, on making sure that that authority continues to be funded and that we don't leave the valley behind in in all of our talk of transition to renewables. So what's next? Uh, we've talked a bit about where we're at in Victoria. We've talked about some of the things that Victoria has already done to get us on the path to getting off brown coal. Uh, but obviously we're not there. And that first graph that I showed you showed that if we just stuck with our current policies, we'd still be on track to burning half of our energy from brown coal by 2040. And we know if that's the case, then really we're, we're all quite doomed if we're still burning coal out into 2040, even though the power plants have licenses that go that long. So what do we need to do now? Uh, it, we, this is the plan that we've developed, but it's not, um, you know, it's not something that needs to be owned by us. Anyone can pick up any of this. And we've been working with the government to make sure that they understand some of these plans and, and how they might be beneficial for the state. So this is a, a bit of a breakdown of, of how I believe we could get to 100% renewables for Victoria in the next 10 years to create jobs while we do it, to reduce power bills while we do it, and to really bring the power back into public hands. And the good news is that just a few weeks ago, the parliament actually agreed to our motion for an inquiry into how we could get to 100% renewables in Victoria. So late last year, we, we did some work in the parliament trying to get the government to increase their renewable energy target. And one of the barriers, well, one of the reasons why a lot of people voted against that was they said, we just don't think it's possible to get to 100% renewables. So we've changed tack and we said, well, let's have a proper parliamentary inquiry into how do we get to 100% renewables? What are the barriers? What are the opportunities? How could we do it? Are there things that are standing in our way? And so this inquiry will start next year and it's an opportunity for MPs from all political parties, there are all political parties on that panel, to really hear from the experts about what's required. What are the barriers? Let's hear from the experts rather than just the political pundits as to what's really possible. And so I want to touch now on a few elements of this plan and why I'm excited about how, why I think we can get there. So 100% renewable energy will require a big build of renewable energy. Our analysis estimates Victoria needs to build about 4,500 megawatts of new renewable energy in the next 10 years. Uh, more if we'd like to significantly expand things like electric cars or green hydrogen, for example. And it could be done in various ways, but the starting point is a bit more big, just big renewables. So things like a big government owned build of renewable energy. Uh, we could also increase the reverse options to stimulate private investment. We could also increase some small scale solar and community owned renewables. But the point is that it's possible. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a bit of a mock up of what the star of the South could look like. Um, if we had a few more of these big projects that were contributing 10, 20% of our energy needs, we'd, we'd be right on track. We also need storage. More storage is absolutely vital 
to our plan to, um, we don't need but more base load, uh, the fair few of base load power, but we do need storage to help the reliability of the grid and South Australia has shown that with their Tesla batteries that when their uh, energy system was literally hit by lightning, they were able to weather that storm because of their Tesla battery and it's actually making money. Um, the, the grid connection and actually the workforce of the Latrobe Valley lend it to being a particularly good place for, for batteries to be located. Um, and potentially we could, there's a role for government intervention in making the Latrobe Valley a bit of a centre for battery testing and innovation to utilise the natural advantages we have there. They might not have the best wind, they might not have the best solar resource, but they do have a workforce, they do have uh, institutional knowledge about how energy works and they do have the, their pride and their history in being an energy generating centre which could be very useful if we wanted to centre a, a battery innovation centre somewhere. Um, of course batteries aren't the only way to provide storage, we can have virtual power plants where lots of houses are managing their solar like a battery, pumped hydro should be part of the mix uh, using uh, electric vehicles as, as a virtual battery as well are all things that we need to be looking into. Uh, I also mentioned earlier that upgrading the grid will be absolutely vital if we want to get us to 100% renewables. I believe the priority does need to be upgrading the lines in north and west Victoria given the, the bang for buck we could get there but the, the Victorian government has indicated they're also looking at a new interconnector with South Australia or New South Wales and that's great, but it's important that that doesn't happen in isolation because we don't simply want to be shipping brown coal to South Australia or black coal from New South Wales or from Victoria. And another huge opportunity for Victoria includes using our government owned buildings to create energy and creating social benefits as well as economic benefits. So we've got just over 1500 public schools in Victoria. Most of them don't have solar on their roofs. Uh, they use energy in the day when the sun's shining and then close just as the peak hits often in the sunnier months, just when people are getting home to turn their air conditioners on. In summer, when they're not being used, we could be benefiting from having solar on all of those schools. Of course, it also saves the government money on their power bills themselves and they could be connected through a virtual power plant and we have a costed plan for how we can make this happen. And there are also other benefits of putting solar on public buildings, such as public housing. We have a, a, a costed plan, costed through the Parliamentary Budget Office for putting solar on all standalone public housing dwellings as a way to help primarily to help people reduce their bills, but obviously it would have a big benefit for climate as, and for grid stability as well. And innovative models for looking at solar for renters for example, we know that there are some innovative models out there that we could look into as to how we can help people, not just who own houses to have solar, but people who rent to have solar as well. And energy efficiency, it's not something that's particularly sexy, but it's something that I know that the community in Renew is very knowledgeable about, and there hasn't been enough work done at a Victorian government level to look at how we can really incentivise energy efficiency because those demand side measures are just as important as the supply side measures. And I think we should be actually grasping this opportunity that we have now to go further than we might otherwise have done. I, uh, during crises, and we're, we've just had this huge shock to our society with the pandemic and this huge crisis in society where all of a sudden, things that we thought were never possible in our society became possible overnight. If you had told me two months ago that the government would double New Start or would make childcare free, I would have told you you were crazy, that that was just not possible in Australian society today. But they happened and they happened because there was this huge need and there were these ideas floating around about how we could make childcare free or how we could uh, solve uh, this problem of, of New Start being so low, and they were there ready for the government to pick up. And people now have this renewed sense that we're all in this together and that government has a very strong role in protecting people. And we can use this 
sense to think about advocating for solutions that benefit all of us into the future and also help with climate change. So something like bringing energy back into public hands through a public energy retailer where we're not paying Origin Energy and these other big energy corporates, you know, 40% of our bill to go to their marketing budget, whereas actually we're having a public energy retailer like we used to have. Can we think about actually government being a player in energy again? Um, these big power plants, they were built by the government and they weren't privatised until the 90s. What's stopping the government from, from being an energy creator again and just going in and building them for the benefit of all Victorians? These are things that maybe previously we said weren't possible and now perhaps are possible. Uh, and of course, a plan also needs to not just look at how we create renewables, but how we get off fossil fuels because just creating new renewables doesn't necessarily mean we then go and switch off fossil fuels. We actually need a deliberate plan for how we do that, how we phase them out. And in particular, we need to look at gas. Uh, I'm not sure if many of you saw, but today the Australia Institute released a report that talked about the Victorian government's decision to open up onshore gas drilling again, which happened about a month ago, which was quite disappointing for me after we'd fought so hard for that moratorium. And the Australia Institute released a report that said that actually the emissions from gas are seven times more than what the government is estimating. So we need to get rid of this idea that gas is a transition fuel and we need to look at alternatives both for households and there are some easy things we could do to incentivise people to get off gas for heating and cooking. Um, we also need to just stop connecting new suburbs to gas. It's a, a disastrous policy that will leave people paying these huge gas bills for years and years to come, and then look at alternatives for industry as well. So now I wanted to talk briefly about the COVID pandemic that we're all in and what this means for climate change. After the summer's devastating bushfires, climate change was the top political agenda. Uh, I don't know about you, but for me, January feels like about three years ago, not three months ago. So much has changed in the last couple of months. And maybe you're feeling like you're worried about what this means for our work on climate change. I've certainly had a lot of people contact me and say, what does this mean? Is climate change going back to a bottom tier issue? Has it been pushed off the political agenda? And it feels like that some days, there are certainly some worrying signs. We've seen new logging agreements announced by governments. We've seen that the government announce their end to the moratorium on gas drilling and not get that much pushback on that. We've seen New South Wales approve new coal mining in sensitive areas. So there is some cause for concern, but there's also some really positive signs out there. Earlier this week, I was briefed on some recent focus group research that showed that Victorians feel more connected to each other than ever before, and they believe in the power of government to change things more than ever before. People really feel that we're all in this together. They feel like they're part of a society and a whole and not acting just as individuals. And that's really powerful and it is a real shift to this sense that we're one society, one country, and that we actually need to, all of our actions, affect other people and we should act to the benefit of others. It's really good news that those values are coming out of people and we can invoke these values to not just deal with the pandemic, but to deal with climate change as well. Secondly, the government will be looking for ways to stimulate the economy and create jobs once the immediate health threat of the pandemic starts to diminish. And if we can frame climate solutions as job creators, if we can feed them into government policy making and talk about how beneficial they'll be as economic stimulus measures, then we're on really good ground. And especially if we can do this in a way that assists regional and bushfire affected communities to recover, those communities that have been hit with this double whammy of bushfires and COVID, then we can potentially see a Green New Deal type policy adopted 
which will help climate solutions and economic recovery. So hitting two birds with one stone. And this is something that is, is being looked at, particularly in Europe at the moment as well. But we do need to be vigilant. There no doubt will be fossil fuel lobbyists in government ears telling them that the only way to solve this, the only way to create jobs and save the economy is through opening up new fossil fuel projects. We know that's not true. We know we can do things differently. We know that we can create a better normal after this virus has gone. We know that we can create not only a stronger community, but also create jobs in a, a new, cleaner economy coming out of this. So that's all that I had for you. And I very much look forward to, to taking your questions. And I hope that that's been informative. I hope you didn't know all of it. I'm sure many of you knew much of it, but I'd love to have a discussion now about your ideas and your questions for me. Good, thank you. Uh, lots of questions. Um, and I'll try and accumulate a few of them into one. So questions about why shouldn't we close your lawn early, seeing they've already received a very large subsidy, and um, that would seem to have a major impact quickly. Yes. Um, look, if I was in charge of the government, I would have closed your lawn already. We can close your lawn. Um, there's no doubt about that. Um, the government, many of you may know, a couple of years ago, the, the licence for your lawn and Lo Yang was uh, due to expire and they got extended out. And so out till 2032 for your lawn and 2048 for Lo Yang. So essentially they have under law the right to continue until 2032 and 2048, which as we know from all the science, if they did that, it would be game over for us meeting any kind of reasonable climate targets. So we have to absolutely close them earlier. Our plan that we've done some, some modeling about when you might shut each unit, and you can find that easily online, but doing it in a staged way so we're not shutting them all at once and getting a spike in prices or any kind of unreliability issues. So closing them unit by unit over the next 10 years, and that's absolutely possible. And I think, in fact, we can do it a lot quicker than that. The other point to note is that these coal stations, and I mentioned this briefly, but these coal stations, it's not just the carbon emissions that are a problem, it's mercury and nitrous oxide and sulfur and all these other really nasty chemicals. And there's been some reports lately about just how bad they are compared to coal plants overseas, and ours are really the worst when it comes to things like mercury. And the government's been in a two year long process with the EPA to renegotiate the licenses and how um, the kind of standards for these power plants and how much they're allowed to pollute. And they're supposed to have made a decision, but we, we just continue to wait. But there's been a lot of good people in the community working on the health impacts of coal and, and why that's just as big an issue and why we actually if we're not going to shut them, we at least need to put scrubbers on them and, and set limits to make sure that they can't spew out as much toxic stuff as they do. Good, thank you. Another one from John and Herb. Can the Star of the Sea be hurried up? Can it be brought forward? Can't it be bigger? Because there's now 20 megawatt turbines available. And yeah who will end up owning it and making the profit from it? All very good questions. And I probably don't know the answer to all of them, but if you just Google the Star of the South um, project, there's a lot of information on there. So my understanding is currently it's in the kind of feasibility project stage. And there's a lot of, um, it's got a lot of good backers. So including a lot of the unions are very, very excited about this. Uh, my understanding is it's got approval from the Australian government to be doing testing and it's had um, kind of a, it's, going, it's going through a community consultation project at the moment that I think will end in May, uh, making sure that they're getting the location of the, you know, the, the onshore bits right with the local community. 
um, but it would be owned by a private company currently. But again, if, if I owned the government and if I, in an ideal world, these things would be built by the government and owned by the public. But under the, the current prioritised system that we have, my understanding is it would be a private enterprise. And I don't know if they're looking at some of these bigger turbines, but I'm sure that they'd be really willing to talk to you if you, if you just got in touch with them. Thank you. John is ask, asking, she, he's really interested in the 100% renewable plan, um, but why is it presented as carbon emissions reduction rather than increasing jobs? Shouldn't we be doing addressing the underlying societal benefits to get this to move forward quickly? Absolutely. I'm just going to go back to that slide to show you. We've deliberately here put our plan will create thousands of new jobs and we present it differently in, in different ways. I thought that um, this audience in particular would understand the, the emission reduction targets and the need for that. And um, so I've presented it in more of a technical way, but absolutely when we're out there talking about it, we're talking about jobs. And I think that only becomes more important in a, in a world where we're going into an economic depression and where unemployment will be people's number one concern, absolutely understandably, that we, we need to talk about renewable energy as job creators. And not just renewable energy, but things like energy efficiency retrofits, things like bush regeneration, things like weed and pest control in our national parks, things that we know will contribute to climate solutions but are absolutely job creators and economic stimulus, particularly for our regions. Good. Andy's asking about storage. What amount of storage do you think is needed by 2030? And what percentage of the total would that be? And will it be all batteries? Mm. And Ian's got a related one, but maybe answer that one first. Um, I don't know about putting a megawatt target on it exactly um i think we don't have necessarily all the resources to do that exact modeling but i think that needs to be done by the government absolutely uh, from the research that we've done i think it shouldn't be all batteries i think it absolutely should be a combination of big batteries pumped hydro and i know that there are some academics looking into the feasibility of using the the ponds, the pondage at, at Hazelwood and other stations um, for pumped hydro. I'm not sure how feasible that is, but there are some academics who've been looking into that. And virtual power plants. And so virtual power plants either, well, all of, all of the above, um, as I mentioned, putting solar on schools and public housing and connecting them up to a, a virtual power plant. You could also put batteries in schools to assist that. And then also using electric vehicles as batteries as well. So. Victoria is also rolling out some microgrid trials, which will be really interesting to see how they go to help localise our energy supply. And that will also help with energy security and reliability. Right, Ian, okay. you've answered part That's of your nice. question. Sorry, I'll come to you in a sec, Doug. Um, about pumped hydro and He's also wanting to extend it to hydrogen production, storage and generation. I'm mm. concerned about batteries because of their cost, relatively short life and the chemicals and components they use. And is nuclear a possibility? Yeah, absolutely. Really good questions. Um, in terms of hydrogen, yes, um, this is a really exciting thing, I believe, to the opportunity to use, to use green hydrogen. Currently in Victoria, there is actually a project that's been funded by taxpayers, by the Victorian government, for brown hydrogen, which is using brown coal to, to make hydrogen in the Latrobe Valley. And it's a very bad idea. It's very, very inefficient. It's very, very expensive for the amount of energy you end up storing. And it prolongs the life of brown coal power plants. And that's why the government's done it, because they're looking for alternative uses of coal because they know that it's, this combustion is on the way out and they're looking for other ways to continue to use our coal resource in Victoria. But it's really the wrong way of doing it. 
very expensive, very inefficient, very, very dirty. Whereas in South Australia, they're looking at green hydrogen. Other places around the world are looking at green hydrogen. So using our renewable energy resource to create a hydrogen, which then can be used as a battery source um, or even exported as a way of exporting our sunshine to other countries. And so our, our federal colleagues have some, they've done, done some really good thinking and put out some really good plans around how uh, Australia as a whole could become a green hydrogen powerhouse. And I think it's a really exciting way to go. And in terms of nuclear, I would say no. I think it would be, for a start, a very unpopular thing to introduce, particularly in Victoria. I'm not sure which community would like to have a nuclear power plant near them or a waste dump. Um, I think that just in terms of the cost and the lead time, it's probably not feasible in the next 10 years and the water use as well. Good. Doug, did you want to ask your question? No, sorry, we seem to be getting a um, crossover audio from somewhere. I'm not, it's not me and it's not Ellen, so it's ghosts in the machine, but go right ahead. Right, okay. Um, another question from John. How can we stop logging of native forests before 2030? And will it save Victoria money and provide habitat for stressed wildlife? Yes, is the short answer. I guess the long answer is it's important. My presentation focused mostly on energy, as you would have known. Um, there's a lot of other elements of climate change. Um, transport is one that we haven't talked that much about tonight and emissions from transport are going up and we need a plan to deal with transport, but it is trickier than energy. Uh, in terms of land use and forestry, it is the single best way that we can sequester emissions is simply to stop logging our native forests in Victoria. They are the most carbon dense forests in the entire world, the mountain ash forests that we have around Gippsland and around the Central Highlands in Victoria. And so it's not just about biodiversity, that's incredibly important, protecting some of our most endangered species, also protecting our water catchments, our water comes from these, some of these forests, the water for Melbourne, but in terms of climate impacts, we actually do need to start looking at carbon drawdown because if we're even if we get to net zero emissions through energy for example if we switch all of victoria to 100 percent renewable energy we still may not get to the reduction in emissions that we need and so we may need to do that through other sectors industry transport land use and carbon drawdown but we don't have some magical machine that sucks carbon out of the air, except we do when it's called a tree. And we could, instead of planting trees, which we should do as well, we could actually just stop cutting them down in the way that we do and, and burning those forests. Currently, I think what John was referring to, the Victorian government has a plan to phase out native forest logging over the next 10 years, but it needs to be done a lot quicker than that, 10 years, that, that'll see the end of species like the leadbeater's possum and we just released some independent advice from the parliamentary budget office who looked at if we phased it out now and actually had a transition plan quite a, a big amount of money for loggers and industry to get out now so that we weren't compromising people's jobs or livelihoods uh, what would that do what would that mean and it actually would save us nearly $200 million over the next 10 years. So logging is actually an industry we subsidise as a taxpayer. So stopping it will actually make us money. So for me, that's an absolute no brainer, but there's a lot of political forces at work in Victoria that are preventing that from happening. Angelo asked a question, surprised that the emissions graphs are two years out of date. How can we speed up the data flow? Mm. That's a really good question that I don't know the answer to. I'm also very frustrated, I'll go back to them, because I know someone had a question about the land use emissions as well, which I can go to. Um, yes, it is very frustrating that they're out of date and 
some NGOs like the Australia Institute, a think tank, uh, try to cobble together data from different sources to give us a bit more of a, a real time update on our emissions. But this is the best source that we have, which comes from the federal government's inventory. Um, you can see down here the Australian Greenhouse Emissions Information System. And unfortunately, it's just really out of date. Um, some people asked about these green bars. So the LULU CF, which is land use, land use, land use change in forestry. Um, so this shows, the ones down the bottom show where uh, it's actually positive emissions. So for example, growing forests and the ones up here are negative emissions. So these um, were around the bushfires. So around Black Saturday, a lot of emissions released. Um, if we went out a, another couple of years, we'd see a big bar here from all the emissions released during the last summer's bushfires. I don't know specifically what these positive emissions relate to, but I do know that the, the way that the government accounts for land use change is pretty dodgy and pretty inaccurate. So for example, if you log a forest, they won't necessarily count the emissions that you've lost, but then they will count the emissions that you've gained by regrowing that forest. So this is a little bit misleading. I've just lost my track here. Um, why can't this, this is from Tony, why can't the federal government simply transfer taxpayer subsidies for fossil fuels, $20, $29 billion to renewables? They could, they could, um, they could if they wanted to, is the answer to that question. And from Alan, I feel that solar panel rebate is over generous. Solar is so cheap, it doesn't need a subsidy. It would be better to spend it elsewhere. What are your thoughts? Yes, look, that, that is right. Um, as I mentioned when I was talking about that, I think I said that it's probably not the best bang for buck in terms of dollar per emissions saved. Uh, it is quite generous. You are giving people who can probably afford to put solar on their roofs $2,000 for free <laughs> as a bit of a kick to do it. Um, no doubt it has helped some people put solar on their roofs that weren't going to otherwise. But for a lot of those people, they probably would have done it anyway. And so, look, my, my cynical analysis of it is that it was a good political move by the government, but I know we're not really here to talk about politics. Um, and I do think that it's useful sometimes to do those policies that target households to make sure that people are, are accepting of renewable policies. And so that they, they did neutralise this argument by the fossil fuel industry that, that it will increase people's prices because people are putting solar on, they're seeing their power bills go down. They're much then more likely to go and support the government investing in big solar or big wind, for example. So that is a smart strategy, but in terms of what you, what else we could have done with that money in terms of emissions say, there probably was a better way to spend that. But um, look, all of these calls the government's making is not just about dollars per emission saved. It's also, they're also having to factor in a whole bunch of other things. Antonia, in what ways is the government encouraging local shires and councils to reduce emissions? Um, probably in not enough ways, I would say. There have been some successful programs, um, such as one that was started in the city of Darabin, so around Northcote Preston in Melbourne, uh, where they had a system where uh, people could buy solar panels and then pay it off through their rates, for example, which was quite a successful program maybe 10 years ago uh, when, when you know, that was something that people were wanting to do and, and paid off through their rates so they weren't getting a big upfront cost, but as they were saving a bit from the energy, they could pay off those solar panels. And the government did actually expand that program called Solar Savers and put in place a mechanism where every local council could do that if they wanted to. So there were some legislative blocks that stopped councils doing that. And so the government allowed all councils to do that. But in a lot of ways, councils are actually just moving ahead and leading in this space where governments at a state and federal level haven't. 
So again, the city of Darabin was the first municipality to declare a climate emergency. And now we've seen hundreds of cities around the world declare climate emergencies and then take flow on actions from that. We've seen, for example, the city of Melbourne brokered a partnership with some big organisations like universities and other cities to essentially buy a wind farm in Western Victoria and get a lot of their energy directly from that, well, yes, from that wind farm. And so a lot of councils are just saying, look, our, our rate payers want us to take action on climate change and we're just going to find ways to do it. But the problem is they have fewer resources than state and federal governments and fewer policy mechanisms and, and levers. And so action is more efficient in climate change at a federal level, but it's welcome at all levels. Good, Doug asks, are there any thoughts about carbon offset sequestration opportunities in Greater Melbourne as part of the puzzle, e.g. blue carbon and salt marshes? Yeah, it's not something I've looked as much into. Um, so I might have to take that one on notice and it sounds like you know a little bit about it. So would always welcome people sending me some more information about that kind of thing. I think we do, there are lots of opportunities out there for carbon sequestration, but as I said, just there are some low hanging fruit that we're focusing on, like not logging our forests in the first place. Um, and once we can get some of those low hanging fruit done, we should move to the next best things as well. Good, and Nail and us, what are the holdups with upgrading the grid? Is it just political will or are there structural issues? Absolutely structural issues. So the number one holdup for upgrading the grid was the fact that the federal rules were set in a way that the Victorian government couldn't really go it alone. Uh, but now the Victorian government's just made new laws for themselves to say that they can go it alone, but they were only passed a few weeks ago in Victorian Parliament. So that's one of the barriers that's now been knocked down. Uh, another barrier is that it is not free. Um, it does actually cost a bit, That's that particularly that northwest section of the grid, it will cost a bit to upgrade. We did some costings, again, independent costings to show how much it would cost and it's not insignificant, but our view is that the government could invest to upgrade that section of the grid and then buy back a section of the grid so that it was held in government hands, public hands, and then it is actually a money-making asset, the grid, and so then the public would receive the benefit of that rather than a private company. So that's one way that we could do it, but that requires a bit of a ideological shift in governments. The governments around the country at the moment, state or federal, aren't particularly fond of of renationalising these big assets, but maybe now after COVID, they'll be more amenable to that. And Gillian, the ideas sound great. Are there any people lobbying the state and federal governments to push for renewable energy jobs to stimulate the economy post COVID? Yes, there are a lot of organisations starting to think like this. Most of the big climate change NGOs, the Climate Council, for example, the Australia Institute, the Australian Conservation Foundation, um, Environment Victoria here in Victoria, are all starting to think about this. Environment Victoria, in fact, put out a uh, communication just a couple of days ago, and their slogan was, build back better. And I thought that was really great. It had a whole bunch of ideas for how Victoria could invest to stimulate the economy to make our future better in terms of environment and climate change. So there's some great ideas in there, and we'll be putting out our own ideas as well, and um, some costed plans for what we can do. And it ranges from anything the things that I've talked about tonight to simple things like fencing off our rivers so that cattle can't get into our rivers and create the kind of destruction that they are, um, which has flowing impacts for our water and our environment. So there's a lot of good ideas out there, creating a, a new land care system where we're actually regenerating the bush and creating, uh, helping with pests and, and feral animal in, and plant incursions, for example, while a lot of our national parks are, are quite empty of tourists. So there's a lot of good ideas out there. 
Uh, I think that the government probably is a little bit overwhelmed at the moment of dealing with the health crisis. Uh, and when they've got a little bit more breathing space, we'll definitely be getting in front of them with those ideas. And John asks, what is the pitch to working people working in carbon intensive industries? I'm old enough to remember the structural reforms of TCF or the car industry. Mm. And working people are probably understandably skeptical that their future dignity is going to be provided by any transition. Yeah, absolutely right. And that's why we've done so much work with the Latrobe Valley in particular, where a lot of this, the pain might be felt from any transition. Been down there, talked to the unions, talked to a lot of the people who work directly in the industry, taken tours of the power stations and talked to the owners. And I think that the number one thing is just not to lie to people, not to say, um, you know, everything will magically be okay, but to be honest with them, that it will be a transition, that it's a necessary transition, but it's one that we need and it's one that we can do in a way that doesn't leave people behind and that we do have their interests at heart. And look, as a Green, perhaps they're not always going to believe me, which is why we need to get other allies on board, which is why we work with the unions, for example, to, to make sure that it's not just us saying it, but it's other people that they trust saying it as well. But I think that a lot of the community down there know me, know people like Adam Vant over many years. He used to be a lawyer fighting for coal workers through privatisation. And hopefully they know we've been around for the long haul and that we're always hopefully honest with them and that we have been advocating for things that support them like the Latrobe Valley Authority, which the government ended up picking up and has created some jobs and some new industries down there. But I can completely understand why people are very skeptical of governments coming in to this space because they saw it with privatisation and, and, you know, they got screwed by it. And so I think people are pretty skeptical of government coming in and telling them thing, anything in the energy space because they've, they had the government prioritise and then they had companies who really didn't treat them very well. So it's something that we need to be vigilant about and, and hopefully constantly be building these alliances to make sure that no one is left behind. And one from Steve, I'll a bit of a different angle. Hi, Ellen. What advice can you give to us regarding personal resilience in the push towards a better, more sustainable, equitable future? Well, maybe you can give me some advice. I'm probably like a lot of you. I go up and down and there are days when I feel very, very hopeful about what we can achieve. And that's generally my state is hope. But there are also days when I, I feel a little bit hopeless. Like I'm not sure if we're going to get there. And particularly the bushfires, I think, was a real wake up call to think, is this the new normal? Is this what me and my kids will be living through? But I take heart in just people all around the country taking action. I love to see that. So just sharing what you're doing, I find very heartening. Um, I think that people need to find whatever gives them solace and whatever lights that fire in you. So for some people, they love the techn technological aspects of it. For other people, they don't really love the technological aspects, but being in nature, gives them hope and really feeds their soul. So go and do more of that. Find out what works for you and do some of that. And don't feel guilty if you need a break. Don't feel guilty if you need to go on a bushwalk or if you need to spend time, you know, doing something that makes you feel good and you're not pouring over graphs and you're not pouring over technological data. That's okay. There's a role for everyone in this movement and you need to find the place that, that fits with what you enjoy because it, it will be a marathon. We're not going to solve this overnight. We will need to keep working for a number of years at, yet until we can solve this problem. And Catherine asks, what financial policy triggers are being considered to promote investment in electrical storage within the grid? The frequency market and normal market will work initially, but as demand levels out with more storage, Theoretically, the financial rewards will dec decrease for new and existing grid storage owners. 
is this being considered? Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that. I think, I think that when we're looking at storage, it does get quite complicated and there will be different financial incentives at different points. Um, but what we really need to do is, I guess, just put in place the financial incentives that work for a period and then reassess them. I think that's what a responsible government would do. Um, there might be something like the big, the big battery, the Tesla battery in South Australia that's making a lot of money now, but then as it's le needed less, it's going to make less and less money. And um, I'm sure that any, anyone who's investing in those assets will have done their due diligence and will do the modelling to show that and government policy, you know, they will be in government's ear saying, this is the kind of financial incentive we need to make this work. So I know the government is working with the private sector all the time to make sure that they've got the incentives right and governments don't always get it right. Um, but so they'll, they'll have to keep tweaking them. Questions keep pouring in. Um, Hi, Alan. Are you keen to hear beyond energy policies and centres for the 90% reduction target being achieved? Agricultural soil renewal and ocean policies settings to sink carbon emissions? Is there anything happening here in Victoria? Yes, very, very good question. And so, as I said before, my presentation focused mostly on energy, but we know that there are other sectors that will need to reduce their emissions to get to the, the 1.5 degrees. Target, absolutely. Um, energy is not going to get there on its own. The reason we talk about energy so much is because it is the lowest hanging fruit and in my view it is quite easy to fix if we had the political will and the right incentives um, and it will get us the biggest bang for buck the quickest. But as I said, transport in particular, actually our emissions are increasing. Our emissions from diesel, believe it or not, in Australia are increasing quite a lot and the Australian Institute's done some really good reports into this um, and so things like the diesel fuel rebate need to go. Uh, electrifying transport needs to happen. Um, electrifying um, not just private transport like electric vehicles but public transport as well needs to happen um, but that's a, that's a lot of investment. And then you get start getting to sectors which are, I think, I think transport's an interesting one because it will happen, I think it'll happen a bit more on its own than some of the other sectors. People are moving towards electric vehicles. Some of the technology is, is ahead of government action, but it's actually already starting. The take up of electric vehicles is, is beyond what governments ever anticipated, so I think people and technology will drive a lot of that innovation, but government policy is also important. But then you get to some of the trickier sectors like agriculture and heavy industry, and there's some really exciting things happening. Um, there's some even things like, not so relevant to Victoria, but things like replacements for coking coal in steel production. There's some exciting hap stuff happening there. Um, using renewable energy to make aluminium, for example, very important to us given that the, the Alcoa aluminium smelter in Victoria is one of our biggest energy users. Um, so some of this industry stuff is, is starting to happen, um, replacing gas use in industry, we're starting to think about that. Agriculture, I think, is one area where not as much is happening. And I know there are some really good people thinking a lot about regenerative agriculture, which is great, but I don't think much is happening at a government level in terms of agriculture or in terms of those other things that the questioner mentioned around um, oceans and sequestration and those kinds of things. So a lot more work needs to be done there. And unfortunately, our successive governments have not done very well at funding science. And so we need a, a big increase in our research budgets to help us move in the agriculture and, and those other kind of sequestration and more cutting edge spaces as well. One I'd like to, to move on is on cement, mm. which is a huge, about 6% of the world's CO2. Um, we could replace Portland cement completely if we wanted to. 
and one of the uses is slag and um, uh, sh shell from coal, Southers and clays from coal. So it yeah. will be a good one for us to do research in. I think in Victoria. Yeah, and this and this um the graph that I've got up on the screen at the moment, you can see that industrial processes and products is the little grey uh, line, and you can see that it's, it is increasing. And so I'm. Sh while at the moment it's not a huge source of emissions in Victoria, so the bang for buck you're getting from those kind of things is not huge at the moment, we will have to get to it eventually. And Wendy asks, is there any chance for green hydrogen here in Victoria? Uh, yes, I think so. I think that there are potentially uh, places in Australia where it might be more efficient to do it, places that are a little bit sunnier, for example. Um, places that um, are better to export it. Um, so I think WA in particular and the export market to Indonesia, places like that. Uh, but I think that we should absolutely be looking to it in Victoria as well. And Vicky asks, could we, might we, the Victorian government offer green bonds to fund large renewable energy projects like Star of the Sea? Yes, they could, absolutely. That's something they should be looking into. Um, but I do think that the government could just borrow to build. Um, I think that that's a really valid thing for a government to be doing, particularly now that we're seeing with COVID that governments are more uh, amenable to this idea of, of stepping in and directly solving problems. And the government is, building a lot of infrastructure here in Victoria. It's just things like big toll roads rather than renewable energy infrastructure. Um, and in some circumstances, the Victorian government has been more, um, more interested in bringing things back into public hands and they've created a public toll, tolling company, for example, for the Northeast Link. So I think we do have a chance now to actually make the case that yes, private investment um, could be incentivized, but let's look at public investment in these kinds of things as well. I know the government is looking into green bonds though. David asks, how can we best capture the current goodwill and intent amongst the community and encourage governments to support and fund climate action projects post COVID? I don't think there's a silver bullet, unfortunately, but just keep up everything that you're doing and keep talking to your friends and family about it and, and keep putting the pressure on governments. I encourage everyone to continue to engage in issues outside of COVID where you feel able to. Um, the government needs to know that we haven't all stopped caring about climate change. And if we can be contacting them and saying, we know that you're setting the emission reduction targets. You, know, you need to be thinking about getting out of coal. We need to be thinking about stopping logging earlier. You know, I support targets that are in line with keeping us below 1.5 degrees or below. I think it's, it's really important now that we don't lose track of that. And there are a lot of good organisations that have started thinking about how do we take our activism online while we're all at home. So organisations like the Climate Council, for example, are doing good work, Environment Victoria, you know, and my organisation. Um, so I'd just say keep engaged with those organisations and they'll get in touch with you when they need your help. And Steve asks, and I like this question, is mandatory disclosure of the energy performance of residential buildings at the point of sale lease likely to be implemented in Victoria? in the short, medium term. And I'd like to extend it to be, how about standards on new houses being increased? Yes, please. I am not overly optimistic though, unfortunately. This is something that we've been advocating for since before I was elected, so probably 10 years ago. Um, energy efficiency is a huge gap still in Victoria, unfortunately. And it's because in some places there are split incentives, you know, between landlords and, and renters, for example. But um, 
I also think that the government just hasn't found a way to to crack that nut and hasn't found a way to sell it to the electorate, which is a real shame because there's so many gains that could be made. We've been working with the Consumer Affairs Department for many years, trying to get them to have mandatory standards for rental properties and then also, as you say, uh, mandatory disclosure at point of sale. But the Victorian government very much relies on the real estate industry for their taxes and so therefore I think they're loath to do anything that would make any more work for um, the real estate industry, unfortunately. But we'll keep working on that. And Rachel asked, what are your thoughts on how long the sector's pledges will be delayed? Um, do, do I assume that question means the emission reduction targets? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know is a short answer. Um, the government was supposed to make their decision by the end of March and then had until June to announce their decision and they've said that it will be delayed. So we don't know if that means they have not made it or whether they made it and now they want to remake it in light of COVID and the economic impacts or whether they just are delaying the announcement of the decision. I suspect they had almost made the decision and now they want to go back to the drawing board because of the economic impacts of COVID, which would be a real shame if they watered down the targets. And so I don't think they're going to announce anything until later in the year, which gives us, I guess, a bit more time to make sure we're all contacting the Victorian government and telling them what kind of targets we want them to set. And Sue asks, what are the possibilities of Victoria setting up its own carbon credit trading scheme and what might it look like? Very good question. Um, Many people were probably around during the Howard years when an emissions trading scheme was proposed and Howard very much fought it and the states went ahead and set up their own. And then Kevin Rudd came in and, and kind of all rolled all the states emissions trading schemes into one federal one. Um, I think that it's probably unlikely that states would do that again. But if we continue to have an impasse and no action at a federal level for some time, I'm sure it's something that states will look at. Uh, but the reason we had one under Howard was because it was all Labor governments at a state level and then a Liberal government. So there was all the state governments were one party and the federal government was a different party, whereas at the moment we don't have that, we have a whole mix. And so I, I'm not sure that Victoria would go it alone without the backing of other states, and I'm not sure other states would back Victoria. But you never know. And Keith asks, rooftop solar is a strong market segment to enable renewable energy, similarly large scale solar. Uh, but what is being done for the one to five megawatt solar farms and the, into the distribution grid? And is there a strategy to encourage more of these, like a community levy? Yes, no, not really. Um, I know that the community energy advocates have definitely got aligned to government and are talking about the barriers that are faced in that segment. Um, I don't think the government's really come up with anything to help fix um, the problems that those segments are, are dealing with. So, unfortunately. I think there's been a bit of tinkering around the edges in terms of removing some of the red tape, but I'm, I'm not quite sure it's enough. And we'll have just a few more questions. Peter, there's quite a, a list, so I'll have to chop and change here a bit. Peter asks, really great, Ellen. Uh, bravo to Extinction Rebe Rebellion, who say two to three percent of people acting is sufficient to make a change. Are there enough wealthy conserv conservationists to fund three percent of the bottom side of the market to revalue energy as the shortest life cycle to the highest price, lowest cost? 
That was some question. Did you understand it? Ellen? Um, I'm not quite. I don't quite understand that one. So I think you're saying you only need 3% to change mm. opinions. Yes. So are the 3% of very rich people who are willing to put up enough to change the, the system? Yeah, I think that 3% figure is 3% of the population, population taking quite drastic actions, like direct action, which jolts the rest of the population into uh, realising a need for a change. I think that's the research that I've seen. Um, I'm not sure if that translates to 3% of the wealthy people funding funding the solutions that we need, but um, you know, aren't are there figures that the top 1% you know, has more wealth than the bottom 90% or something? So I'm sure that if the top 3% of wealthy people in this country stumped off enough money, we could definitely change things, but I'm not sure that they, they would, are willing to do that at this point. Good idea though. And John that probably didn't answer your question, but. John asks, with buses, could government loan money for bus fleet upgrades? and have the bus companies pay it back through diesel savings? Uh, yes. Um, the problem we have in Victoria is that the bus system is so convoluted and complex that it's actually just quite ridiculous, just how many different small businesses and medium-sized businesses own all the different bus routes, and it's actually quite remarkable. I'm not the transport portfolio holder, so I don't know enough about this as much as I do about energy, but I do know that it's a real dog's breakfast, um, and not enough has been done to incentivise electrification um, or even cleaning up of our bus fleet. I'm sure anyone who's been riding their bike behind a bus knows that when you get a um, face full of diesel fumes. Um, there had been some trials of electric, there has been some trials of electric buses in Victoria. Um, that actually came out of a, a Greens inquiry we did about three or four years ago. Um, we asked the government to, the parliament to inquire into uh, electrification of the bus fleet and there were some good recommendations coming out of that. So anyone who's interested, if you just look up the Parliament Victoria website and look up committee inquiries. Um, there will be one from a few years ago on electric vehicles. And coming out of that, the government has rolled out some trials of, I think, electric bus routes and some of the smart bus routes. So it's getting there, but it, it's, yeah, it's very slow and I'm sure that it could be done a lot quicker. And perhaps just about the last question. Andrew, Andre, I'll abbreviate his question is, um, what is the impact in a general way of the COVID-9 pandemic making a massive reduction in energy and um, the environmental impacts? What is going to happen afterwards and how is that going to influence action? Mm. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I've seen a lot of reports like you all probably have as well about the uh, reduction in emissions from the downturn in airline travel, for example. Um, also, you know, species kind of uh, not being as bothered by humans as they might otherwise be. And so I've seen beautiful pictures of you know, turtles breeding on, on beaches where usually they couldn't because humans were on those beaches. But I do think we need to be a little bit careful with this narrative because in dealing with climate change, we don't want to create a world where everyone is confined to their homes, where people are literally stuck inside and being um, forced inside by the police. Um, we don't want to send you know, the world back into the dark ages. That's not the kind of future we're trying to create in dealing with climate change. We know that in dealing with climate change, we can create a better future. We can create a future where we are all connected to each other, where we live in strong communities, where we have a really good quality of life, not where we're all kind of stuck in our, in our, in our homes without access to the people we love or the things we love doing. And so we don't want to kind of say, yay, look at, look at this, COVID is, is, um, creating fewer emissions because 
we're in a crisis and people are really suffering and people are losing their jobs and that's not the kind of world that we want. Um, there's also some negative impacts on the environment through this pandemic. So for example, the bushfires, post bushfires, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to stop weeds and pest species destroying our precious alpine environment, for example. And that work's not being done because of COVID. And so we're seeing some of our parks being really overrun with weeds because we're not able to send people in there to deal with them. Um, and so there are some negative impacts as well. Um, so I think we just have to be careful to, to celebrate anything to do with COVID because this is not something we're celebrating. But it is, uh, but we can use once the, the health threat has diminished, we can make sure that governments know that they can build back a better world after this that deals with not only the economic depression we'll be going into, but also the climate crisis, which remains. One last question from Angelo. Solar on homes has been a great success. Why not do the same in schools coupled with batteries? This project could also be coupled with education of the children on the technology, energy efficiency in the schools. How could we roll this out promptly? Great question. Um, if this is the last question, I might finish by telling your story. Correct. After I graduated from university, I actually went and worked for Premier Brumby in the Department of Premier and Cabinet. And I was in his climate change team, the first climate change team that the Premier had, had put together. It was a, just a small team of us and we were tasked with looking at how Victoria could essentially help solve climate change. And one of the projects that I was actually tasked at looking at was how we could maybe put solar panels on every Victorian school. And the Premier got very excited about this project. Uh, he'd just come back from the Bali climate change talks where Kevin Rudd had made his big speech and signed us up to the Kyoto Protocol. And the Premier was very excited, came back and said, let's do this. And so I did a lot of work talking to the department about how it could link to the curriculum and figuring out how, it would, how much it would cost and how it could be rolled out. And then in, uh, this was I think, 2008 February January 2008 it was the first day of school and it was 37 degrees and as I rode my bike to the office and got into the office and saw this piece of paper on my desk which was a brief from the premier that said uh, scrap the solar idea how do we put air conditioners in every in every school um, and that was because there'd been an influx of calls to Neil Mitchell to talk back radio from parents saying that they were upset their kids have to go to school in all these classrooms without air conditioners on such a hot day. And so that plan got scrapped. Uh, and unfortunately, it was never really resurrected. I think the, the government probably was a bit burned by that. But it is a very, very sensible idea to put solar on schools. It saves the government money. It's a great educational tool. It can be a virtual power plant. All those summer days where we need power, but the schools don't, We've got these huge roof spaces. It's just a no-brainer. And um, I'd be surprised if in the next few years we don't see an announcement to that effect. Great. Well, that was a tremendous session. Um, it's a pity you can't clap on the, the system or <laughs> um, thank you in a, a more uh, visible way. We're getting lots of comments to say thanks. And it's been a great show. Thank you for having me. So, um, and thank you for all going through all the technology. So we're we're getting used to it, I think. So once again, thank you very much, and we hope to see you at maybe another meeting attending on the other side. See you, everyone. Thank you.